Um, this is Senate Government Operations. It is Thursday, January 14th. And um, today we are going to look at all things elections. Um, what I'd like to do is um, before we start the meeting, I've um, we had some, some training the other day on how to run Zoom meetings effectively. And so I'd like to just share some of those thoughts with you because, um, and if people are here who aren't normally in the committee, um, it, might be, it might be helpful. So really there are um, a few different um, types of participants in these meetings. There's the committee and our, our staff, uh, Gail and the attorneys. And then there are people that we've asked to come as witnesses to testify. And then there are observers in the room who might be with us on the Zoom call, but they are observers. They aren't necessarily testifying. And then there are those people who are watching, um, if anybody is, on YouTube. Um, and the, I'm asking everybody except um, committee members, if you want to keep your yourselves off mute, that's okay, as long as you don't have noise in the background. But I'd like everybody else to remain on mute unless they're speaking or called on. And, um, and I know some people aren't used to um, the way we do this, but really uh, in terms, we might ask for uh, just general conversation after a while, but in terms of the way we uh, listen to things is that the committee is, the committee are the people who are going to be making the decisions. So we are the ones who will be asking the questions and um, calling on people. So um, is there anything else that any committee member would like to add here um, to start off just in terms of kind of protocol and I will call on people. So everybody okay? All right, uh, so, so yes, Ma Senator Clarkson. My dear, um, I, I, I guess um, the one thing, and it's an internal conversation and we should have it in committee, but I am reminded in this conversation that we uh, we all need to be reminded about what happens if something disastrous happens, uh, you know, which happens on some regularity, sometimes just technically and sometimes maybe an intent, something full of intent that would interrupt our work. So it, when we're off, when, when we're just us, we should, we should discuss what our protocols are, you know, what we, uh, that we're, what we're all clear about what we do. Yes. Um, and as much as possible, we want to make sure that most of the committees are operating with the same set of rules. And I will say that um, I am asking people not to use chat. No, none of us are going to pay attention to chat. The only person that is going to be using chat is Gail, and that is if she wants to post links to um, documents that are referred to. Does that make, does everybody okay with that? If we were, if we were in the room, I consider chat sidebar conversations. And if we were in the committee room in person, if people were sitting on the side and having a conversation, I would tell them to be quiet or leave the room. So I'm asking people not to use chat. I don't know if we can't, we can't uh, disable it as long as um, we want Gail to have access to using it um, for posting links to documents. So, all right. So Secretary Condos, I think that we had a very uh, successful election. Um, we've just passed uh, the town, we're calling it the town meeting bill, but we know it's more than that. It's the municipal uh, annual meeting bill. And um, we just passed that out of the Senate and messaged it over to back to the house. So that should be on the governor's desk. I think I'm hoping tomorrow. So anyway, here we are. And what we're gonna do is um, look at all things elections. We're gonna hear from the secretary first. Um, we, does everybody know where their Title Seven? all the committee members, do you know where your Title 17 book is? Uh, I think it's here. I just have to unearth it. Could it, I might, if you know, I know Senator Rahm, you don't have one. 
So okay. I'm gonna try and get you one. And then we're gonna try and get the supplements that have to the to it, but not get new ones for all of us. So if you, Senator Polina and Senator Clarkson and Senator Colmore, if you let me know where you think yours might be, if it's in the state house, in your drawer or in your file cabinet or whatever, I will ask Mike to go um, rummage around and mail it to you. That's what I'm, I'm gonna ask him to do to mail mine. So if you uh, let me know where you think it is, I will ask him to do that. Okay, I thought I'd brought mine home, but it- Okay, well, yeah. we don't need to we'll have it right it now. Yeah, yep, yep. Just, okay. I'm so, and the way um, we're going to do this is we have one bill right now um, dealing with elections. Oh, first of all, I, I, I really apologize. I should introduce Amarin first because Amarin has, this is her um, debut kind of in terms of dealing with an issue with us in government operations. Oh, we so, welcome Amarin. Thank you. We ha I don't think we've actually all met you yet. I mean, we've seen you briefly. I'm Allison Clarkson, Windsor County. Nice to see you. <laughs> you too. Okay, well, everybody introduce yourselves then, I guess, <laughs> if you haven't met her yet. Senator Polina, are you there? I'm back, yes. I'm Anthony Polina, I represent Washington County. Hello. Brian, Brian Collimore, representing Rutland County. And Imran's helping me with some bills, so I've had the pleasure to connect with her already, Keisha Rahm from Chittenden County. Thank you. So um, welcome, and um, I think you'll find that this is probably the best committee to work with. <laughs> <laughs> or we like to think so. We tell everybody that enough it's, times, maybe they'll begin to believe us, right? It's a stiff the competition. <laughs> what, what did you say, Senator Polina? I said, we've, it's a we've, stiff we've, competition. We've, I said we've created a myth. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. So the way I think that we, um, that unless there's a difference of opinion here, I think the way we um, are thinking of doing this elections issue, because there are so many, so many issues and so many um, things to address that uh, we'll hear from people. We'll start making a list of the issues that need, should be addressed and then um, start dealing with them one at a time or in groups as they make sense. We do have one bill already. I think I suspect we will have at least two more, if not more. So um, we'll kind of take them all and get all the ideas out. And then if that makes sense, because I don't, I don't want it to get stuck on one bill. So, Committee, do you have anything to add to that or to disagree with, if you choose? I don't see anybody. Um, I do see uh, that we have somebody who normally isn't with us. I believe, um, Tim, you aren't really, aren't with us very often, are you? Tim? You're muted. No, no, I'm not, Senator White. Uh, it's good to see all of you, and I do pay my my uh, respects both to you as a fellow Wyndham County resident, fellow broadcaster, Senator Collimore, and uh, longtime contact of, uh, uh, gosh, Senator Polina. Been a long time, but I'm still alive and well in my new role. Good. Thank you. Well, we'll get well, to you in a while here. Thank you. Welcome. So um, with that, Senator Secretary Condos, would you like to give us a kind of a debriefing of what, what went well, what didn't go well, where we are, how the election went, where we need, should be going from now on? Absolutely, Senator White. And, uh, you know, you and I have a long history on this committee going back many, well, probably almost two decades now. So that just shows how old we are. Um, <laughs> I do want to say before I get into it, uh, I want to say thank you to this committee uh, for the work you did on H48 um, that just passed that you just moved through all stages to the and back to the House so they could send to the governor. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. I know the, the cities and towns and school districts appreciate that work. 
uh, and uh, we're ready to get started there. I know we had a very collaborative effort between uh, town clerks, between VLCT, uh, between the administration to get that bill to the point where we can move it forward uh, in a quick manner. And you guys have come through with flying colors to get this thing out. Uh, so we really appreciate the efforts you did there. Um, I'm going to kind of give a, a kind of a, a background on, on where we were and where we are uh, or where we've been. Uh, I, I can tell you that uh, the elections team at the Secretary of State's office and frankly, our town clerks have really had no downtime uh, since probably last, I don't know, probably about a year ago. Uh, it's, been, it's been one, one thing after another uh, as, as we've gone. Uh, so I don't know how, I, what's the preferred method here? I've got, I've got my presentation up, but are you guys using yours on your, on your screen? <clears throat> Um, we have your document here. Okay. I, and Madam Chair, if you prefer, I, uh, Gail has made me the, uh, given me the ability to share my screen. If you'd rather I presented it. Um, a committee, what do you think? I tend to not like it because then I can't see people. So I don't know when people have a question or a concern. So does everybody, can everybody access it on the, on our website? Uh, it, if uh, Chris, if you send it to Gail and she posts it, we can look at it on our other devices. She has it. It is. It's, it's on right. our perfect. You go to I'm, the document to our page today right. under documents right. there, and so you can. Um, if if that is um, best, that's uh, the way I prefer, just because I like to be able to see people in case they have a question or um, a concern. All right, well, we'll get started. So- Thank you. Obviously slide one is just our title page. Slide two, uh, to put it bluntly, it's th this past year has been a blur uh, in, in the order and timing of all the events that we've had that are I documented in this. Uh, are approximate and uh, uh, we have to recognize that the coronavirus first became a reality in Vermont back in uh, around the March timeframe. We had just missed town meeting day uh, before staff was sent home to work remotely. Town, town clerks uh, were asked to reduce their hours or pr to protect themselves. Uh, so there was a lot of work, but uh, we had to begin those discussions uh, about what to do in case uh, this thing continued on. And I think most of us thought it was gonna go away before summer, but uh, that didn't happen. So we started having phone meetings uh, about the open meeting law, about elections uh, in March. Uh, Act 92 late in March was signed into law by the governor and it granted uh, both he and I the temporary authority to make elections procedures uh, uh, changes. Uh, in order to respond to COVID. Um, and we issued a directive to, that the, the towns that had uh, not either not had their town meetings yet, because not all town meetings are held on the set first Tuesday of, of March, or school districts that sometimes have uh, school votes later on, or uh, re-votes uh, for failed budgets. So in April, <coughs> We started to plan for the worst and hope for the best. We strategized how to safely conduct 2020 elections. We started having regular meetings with the clerks uh, and with the governor's team. Uh, we came out with a directive that permitted uh, new elections processes uh, at the local level uh, so that they could proactively mail a ballot, curbside voting, outdoor voting, polling place, health and safety. Um, uh, Chris, if you could get ready to post that uh, drive up that we'd had uh, in Southern Vermont. That'd be great. Uh, the governor and I do not did not agree uh, to permit universal mail ballots for the general election at the at this time in April. Uh, he wanted to wait until after the primary to decide. We told uh, the governor's office that it was impossible for us to wait. There was too much work, too much infrastructure, too much detail. Uh, if we waited until after we had to, we actually had to start making contracts 
start uh, doing the, the detailed work, the focus, uh, you know, back in April. Uh, Will started having, uh, at that time, weekly meetings with, with the U.S. Postal Service. Um, in May, uh, the governor continued to want to wait until after the primary, despite our discussions about the, the needs that we had to be, that needed to be completed before. Uh, the legislature restarted the process to remove the governor's role at, which was, by the way, at his request, he actually said, I never asked for this. And uh, it wouldn't bother me if the legislature took me out. Um, you know, we engaged in other partners, Legal Women Voters, AARP, uh, VPIRG. Um, I'm just trying to think. I think there's, you know, there was several other partners that we worked with. Uh, and uh, to, uh, in order to build our election communication broadly, uh, we had, we watched other states' primaries. Now, keep in mind that the majority of states have their primaries before July 4th, their statewide primaries. So we were watching uh, what other states were doing during this COVID crisis uh, and trying to learn from what they were doing. We started to line up mail and printing vendors, uh, getting ready for that. We tried to use a Vermont company, but they decided that it was uh, this was too big a project for them. Um, <coughs> we started securing uh, PPE, um, personal protective equipment for, for polling places. We, we actually uh, purchased what we call infection prevention kits that included um, hand sanitizer, sanitizing wipes, uh, gloves, uh, face masks, uh, and, and sent that all to the, uh, uh, to the, to the towns to, uh, for each polling place that they had. Larger towns got, got two kits, uh, smaller towns got one. Um, and we continued that work with the Postal Service, which, uh, as you will see, that will be a theme that was constant uh, during this whole process. In June, uh, there was still lots of legislative work going on, and we were still planning for a primary, and we had to assume that we would have a mass mailing. In June, we had to make sure that decision that a mass mailing to all voters would, would occur in the fall. Uh, we continued that work with the Postal Service. The legislative work continued with, with proposed amendments. We had to deal with issues of fear of the fr voter fraud, of ballot harvesting. Um, we prepared a primary postcard with a return uh, uh, card to the town clerks. Uh, and it was a slightly different process for this one than what we had for the general election. So the, the postcard was actually open to uh, be forwarded to uh, wherever the forwarding address for that particular person was uh, based on the NCOA, uh, the national um, change of address uh, uh, system that the uh, post office uh, operates. Uh, we had to continue having clerks meetings. Um, we mailed out those ballot request postcards in late June. Uh, and we started to receive them back almost immediately. I think that you've got several clerks here on, on this call. They will tell you that they received a lot of them back, some of them undeliverable, uh, and, and, but they were all designed to help the clerks clean up their, their checklist a little bit. Um, we had Act 135, which did remove the governor, and that became law without the governor's signature. Um, in July, we moved, We were full speed ahead with the mailing. Uh, primary was approaching real fast. Uh, we had continued communication and planning with the clerks. I think the many the clerks that are on this call will probably tell you that Will was in touch with them two to three times a week uh, during this from July on until November. Uh, early voting began the end of June. Uh, we had voter education and outreach beginning. We conducted media availability. Typically, we would hold one media availability before the general election. We chose to have several before the primary and, a, and a, another couple before the uh, general election, just so that the media had all the information they needed to, to convey to the public uh, what we were doing. We continued that work with the Postal Service, and this was a, the time period where the postal Postmaster General in D.C., uh, expressed concern about mail delivery times and, and said to plan on seven to 10 days. Um, 
we had a slightly different approach here in Vermont, but we still planned on using this seven to day, uh, seven to ten day marker uh, as as a uh, kind of as, as a marker for, for voters to use. Um, and we'll get more into that in a minute. In August, we conducted the primary while still planning for a mass mailing to all voters in the fall. Uh, communications, uh, we had a communications push to register request and return to sign, select and seal, and then send or come vote in person. And of course we had a very successful primary election day uh, we had a couple of recounts. Uh, we had post-election work, which included finalizing the ballots for the general election. Post office concerns continued. The, the attorney general joined a national lawsuit uh, to force the, um, um, uh, the post office to stop any changes that they were making at that time that it, it was not helpful uh, in the middle of an election process. In September, logistics, 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 and we had lots of them. We had to get the word out about the changes, the options that were available. We had to continue to hold the clerk's meeting to debrief, to learn from the primary, what we needed to do for the general, and as we were making changes for the general. Uh, we, we had to, uh, um, Will and his team had to create and, uh, design and create the, the ballots. And in, in Vermont, we have 275 different ballots um, that had to be created, sent to the printers uh, with a corresponding number of how many. I know Will had several communications with town clerks about how many ballots they wanted besides what we were sending out uh, to make sure that they had enough for in-person per, uh, in -person polling. Um, we had two lawsuits that challenged the vote by mail, one in federal court, one in uh, state court. The attorney general's office handled both of them and both were dismissed. Um, we were heavily engaged in, in, with our communications partners for voter education and outreach. Example, um, AARP put out a, uh, uh, a postcard to all of its members, some almost 80,000, uh, and that reaches uh, something like 100 and, 75,000 people um, basically saying, you know, you're going to be mailed a ballot, it's coming to you, F you know, fill it out and return it as quickly as you can, uh, because we don't know what the situation is otherwise. Uh, let's see, September, we continued. Uh, how, how are we going to get the word out? We had ballots starting to hit mailboxes. Emails were starting to hit our inboxes. Uh, and I'm sure that the town clerks will tell you that they had a ton of emails coming to them and phone calls from their constituents as well. Um, we had we had to continue the coordinate the ballot requests for after the mass mailing. So we mailed out about 438,000 uh, ballots um, to the active registered voters on the list. But then people would contact the clerk if they were new, if they had moved. Uh, whatever the situation was, uh, they didn't receive their ballot uh, and, the, and the clerks had to handle those requests uh, from, their, from their offices. Um, we had, uh, we, what we did was we mailed them out, not all at once, but in the same time period. So we had about a seven to 10 day period where every few days, there was a big batch of, of envelopes that went out, the ballots that went out. We kept a website uh, active and, ac and uh, updated on a daily basis of which towns had been sent their ballots so people would know. Um, we had, of course, lots of media and lots of questions. We did have a barcode issue. Uh, it was not a barcode on the certificate envelope. It was the barcode on the outside envelope um, that created a little bit of a, the, the post office caught it right away uh, and, and, and um, implemented some immediate steps to handle by, by manually uh, those, ballot, those envelopes as they were coming back. Um, it, it was the, the code was wrong and um, so they couldn't use the automated system in order to, to um, uh, 
move that those uh, clearly through. But we had, a, as I said earlier, Will had a great rapport working with uh, his postal service uh, uh, liaison who handles Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, uh, political mail, political and campaign mail. Um, and and uh, during this whole time period, as, as we got closer and closer to November, Will was on the phone, not once a week, but probably two or three times a week. And uh, we, we had just had a great rapport with the Postal Service here in Vermont. In October, uh, we had completed the, the initial mailing of about 438,000 ballots by the end of, uh, by the 1st of October. Uh, we had a little bit of fallout. There were a couple of, of towns that, uh, uh, well, I, I think Stacy's on this phone, on this uh, Zoom call, uh, and Stacy can tell you there was, there was uh, St. Jay and St. Albans were, had, had gotten, it wasn't the ballot was wrong, it was that the envelopes were wrong, uh, the return address envelopes. Um, so we, we did have a couple of issues that we had to straighten out, but it was really, when you think about 438,000 ballots, uh, that were mailed out, we had very little uh, uh, problems with it. We had to continue to hone uh, the polling place guidance, how they were going to, how people were going to, how the town clerks would, would uh, set up their, their polling places, what guidelines they needed to follow as far as social distancing. Uh, we also had to provide some election day guidance for them on different issues as well. Um, we also, starting back in May, actually, we started having conversations with some of the clerks to find out if they were, if they expected a problem with poll workers. And I will tell you that back in May, there was some concern that they may not have enough poll workers because people were, were uh, uh, telling them, the clerks, some of the clerks were telling them that, that some of their clerk, poll, uh, usual poll workers were uh, declining to work. Um, but as we got closer, it, it really, I don't think that was as big a problem as we expected. Uh, we did have the Vermont Bar Association stepped up and did a mailing um, to make sure that uh, uh, to their members to, to ask them if, if they wanted to help to contact their town clerks. We don't have a clue as to how many of that uh, may have occurred, but we do know that there were some uh, attorneys around the state that, that volunteered. Um, we applied for a grant uh, with the uh, Center for uh, Election uh, Integrity and Research. Uh, they had a sizable grant that they were awarding to states. Uh, we asked for 400,000 um, so that we could help. And our, our mission on, on using that money was to, <clears throat> excuse me, was to um, um, focus on, on communicating to, to the voters about how to get their ballot back in, in the best way. Um, we, and I think the town clerks will, will also uh, uh, agree with this, that early, early mail voting was at a record pace during this time uh, period. Jim, may I just interrupt you for a sec? A sec. Yep. I've gotten a, a couple texts, Madam Chair, saying our, we're not live on YouTube, even though it says we're live on YouTube. Um, Gail, I don't know if you can investigate that, but I've got several texts from uh, people trying to watch and they, they aren't able to access it. I am aware of this and you can direct people to our agenda. I've put up the link for today's live YouTube stream on our agenda. So look at the top of the agenda and it will have a link for today's live YouTube stream. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks for letting me know. So uh, as October was was coming to a close, we had uh, we we started working with the town clerks about in person voting preparation. Uh, we had our communications and outreach plans that we were using, uh, which included uh, the most interesting man in the world, uh, the Dasekis commercials, who happens to live in Vermont, uh, down in the Manchester area. He um, uh, he did a pro bono. Um, uh, actually, all three of these folks, celebrities, did pro bono for us, um, and we did a, a, a digital outreach uh, that we could use as a, uh, um, a media outreach PSA on TV and on um, uh, social media. Um, we also had Grace Potter for another 
demographic. Uh, she did a, um, many of you probably know she's a musician, uh, singer, and uh, she did a, uh, a piece for us, uh, as well as the, uh, the logger, who was another demographic. And, and we really hammered those on social media and in, and in the and the TV media to make sure that people were seeing it. It was all designed to um, help get people aware of how important it was to get their ballots in the mail at least seven to 10 days before. Um, so we, you know, we, we did that. Um, we had poll watcher threats uh, and security planning. We actually did a lot of work with our federal, state, and local law enforcement partners. Those partners included uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the FBI, uh, the Homeland Security, uh, state police, the Department of Public Safety, uh, sheriffs, state's attorneys, uh, as we were getting a lot of concern uh, around what we were seeing elsewhere in the country. So we, um, we, we worked with them to ensure that we had a, a, a plan in place for not only communication, but also what to do in the case of an actual threat. Um, we issued polling place guidelines to the clerks. Uh, we had a, an addendum to the directive that included information about poll watchers, what the poll watchers are allowed to do about how to in-person voting should go along and what to do about additional mailing of requested ballots. Um, November came, it was finally here. We were braced for impact. And the good news is November 3rd was a very successful day for Vermont. Uh, our election night reporting system worked well. Our statewide canvas uh, the following Tuesday went successfully. Republican, Democrat, and, and progressive um, representatives signed off on the canvas. The town clerk, I can't say enough about the support and the work that the town clerks did during this whole six, eight month period uh, to make sure that this, this went well. Um, you know, they were, they were with us at every step of the way. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we relied a lot on them as we usually do, but they really were the backbone of what we did. Uh, and a lot of the credit for Vermont doing it right goes to the town clerks around the state. Um, and, we, and we've seen contested results in other states and, and we've seen those, those contested results continue. Um, you know, we, we did make a decision in late November, actually around the 30th of November to postpone our election audit, which is supposed to occur within 30 days. And that was because the coronavirus was beginning to surge again. Uh, and we had consulted with Dr. Levine at the Department of Health. And since the audit team was coming out of Boston and Boston and, and Bo Massachusetts was having a higher incidence of surge than Vermont, uh, he agreed with us to postpone. Uh, the good news that I think this committee probably knows is that the ballots, uh, we have paper ballots, that's the first thing, but the paper ballots are secured in tamper-proof bags uh, with sealed, numbered sealed uh, uh, seals that, that, that protect the uh, integrity of those. Um, and um, we knew that the clerks hold those in their, in their vaults so that we were confident that we could do this at a later date when things got better. Uh, we will again consult with the Department of Health uh, before we make that decision. Uh, but for right now, we're, we're going to hold off on that post-election audit. And uh, finally, in, a, it, in December, it became official. Uh, we thought that the elections team was going to finally get a deep, take a deep breath and get a few days off. I think if you were to talk to Will, he would tell you that that didn't occur. Uh, we started getting calls from town clerks, from citizens, from select boards, school boards, what do we do about town meeting day? And that's when we started to uh, have the conversations with the governor's team, with legislative leaders, with city and town clerks, with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. And we all agreed that we had to do something and we had to do it quickly uh, because to put it bluntly, today is the deadline for 
issues to be placed on a ballot. Uh, so we knew that it had to happen fast. Next week is the deadline for candidates. Um, by the way, along the way here, we had the Electoral College met and, and voted uh, here in Vermont. Uh, uh, your, your committee member, uh, Senator Rahm, was one of the electors uh, for that. Um, and, um, you know, we had, uh, obviously the rest is, is kind of history there. Um, I do want to, let's see here, let me go. So lessons learned, what worked well? Well, first off, from the August primary, I just want to say that Vermonters really embraced vote by mail. Um, and here you can see turnout rates for the primary um, from 2012 to 2020. And then you can also see the after the, with the letters AB, which is absentee ballot, you can see the percentage of, of ballots that were cast. Uh, and you can see the difference for 2020. We had a, a large increase uh, for overall participation for the primary. And keep in mind what a primary is. The primary is a party nominating process. It's not really an official state election, but we, we treat it that way, but it's really a party of, uh, nominating process. But the key number that I really was impressed with was 73% of the ballots cast, which we, by the way, set a record, 73% uh, of those ballots cast uh, were done either by absentee ballot, early mail, uh, by mail, or early drop off at the, at the clerk's office. Uh, we had early voting, outdoor voting, curbside voting. Chris, if you've got that picture, this is a good time to show it. Sure. Give me just a, a minute here. Keep talking, Jim. I'll get it in All right. Uh, another key was the drop boxes. We provided funding to the clerks uh, to purchase whether it was a wall mounted a through the door or through the wall or a freestanding outside uh, ballot box, drop box, uh, we provided those. Uh, so this, this was Dorset, Vermont at their drive up voting, just to let oh, you know. Great. And notice everybody had a mask on. <laughs> Not the horse. Except, yeah, the horse is missing a mask. So. Uh, that, that was Dorset, Vermont, and uh, we were pretty excited about it. And, and frankly, in Barrie, uh, uh, you had uh, the, the, they used their hockey rink uh, mm -hmm. where you would drive in one end of the hockey rink right across the rink, vote, and out the other end. Um, I think that's how it worked, didn't it, Carol? <laughs> and that was pretty successful. So our town clerks really um, were creative in making sure that they're their citizens uh, were protected, but at the same time allowed to vote. Um, so in the August primary, what are, what are the things that worked well? Well, we had low numbers at the polls, uh, which helps with the, the general health and safety for the, the not only the voters, but also the poll workers. Um, we had a lot of clerk communication and buy-in. We had the postcard mailing uh, which we did as a central mailing out of our, well, not our office, but as a, a, out of a mail house. Uh, we had the postal service in general really was helpful. Uh, there are many, I don't know if any of these clerks have any stories, but I can tell you that, that there were many tremendous stories about what, how the postal service went above and beyond. In Lincoln, uh, the, the postal uh, postmaster in Bristol, would call up uh, uh, Sally Ober and let her know that uh, uh, that she had just received several ballot uh, envelopes and so Sally would send someone down to pick them up to make sure they got counted. Uh, in Randolph, Vermont, the postal workers were going around to, from blue box to blue box on street corners to check the, the uh, box to see if there was any uh, postal uh, any ballot mail in there and then would pull it out and take it to the, uh, the the town clerk down that way so we had a lot of stories like that uh, so they they really were it was it was a tremendous effort by the postal service here in Vermont I can't speak for the rest of the country but I know that Will and his team worked very very closely with the postal service uh, the the town clerks were able to do quite a bit of checklist cleanup 
um, uh, via the, the postcard uh, process. Uh, there's still some stuff that they have to follow the, the federal laws on, but uh, uh, they, they were able to clean up their checklist a lot more. Uh, we allowed the town clerks to have 30 days of early processing. Um, it was up to them. It was not mandated, but they were given the opportunity uh, to begin processing ballots 30 days ahead. Uh, as I said earlier, we, we provided PPE distribution. The uh, State um, Emergency Operations Center uh, had contacted us and gave us additional PPE that we were able to share with our, with our uh, uh, town clerks uh, to make sure that they had enough. Um, and, in, and we also had uh, uh, Anheuser-Busch, believe it or not, it was had switched over from brewing beer to brewing uh, a hand sanitizer, and they provided one gallon jugs with pumps on them uh, to our um, to every secretary of state in the country. Uh, you just placed your order, and they would ship it to us, and then Will and his team would ship it out to the town clerks uh, to make sure that they had plenty of hand sanitizer. Uh, Again, we had voter tremendous voter education with our media and partners. Uh, we had the clerk processing of ballot requests and address changes, and we had that flexibility that you guys provided uh, to use directives. Uh, what didn't work so well in August, we had defective ballots, uh, more than we've ever had before. Um, there were three main reasons. Um, one, as you know, that there are three ballots that have to go out. Uh, when anybody wants to vote in the primary, there are three ballots. You vote one, return all three. Uh, so some of the problems were that people didn't return the two that they weren't using, or they filled out more than one. And uh, the third was that they didn't sign their certificate envelope. Uh, we also had some bad addresses that we had to correct, uh, but uh, you know we, we continued to work our way through it. As far as defective ballots, just so you know, we normally have 1% or less. We had three and a half percent that at the, uh, for the primary. That's not, the primary is always higher than, than the, the general election for defective, but that's because of the process of having those three ballots. Um, and, you know, we'll have further discussions with this committee about ways to try to diminish that in the future. Um, our elections and leadership team were sometimes overwhelmed. Uh, I can tell you that as a matter of fact. I mean, Chris and Eric and myself became honorary members of the elections team. Might I remind you, our elections team is five people. We have the smallest elections team in the country by far. Um, and uh, uh, if they didn't work six and seven days a week, sometimes 10, 12 hours a day, we could not have pulled this off. Um, uh, the clerks also were overwhelmed. They were overwhelmed with requests, with processing, uh, with phone calls, uh, emails from their constituents. Uh, it was it was a constant battle. But I, I I can't say again. I can't say enough about about how well the clerks pulled through. Um, we also um, had that joint authority with the governor that we used uh, to try to deal with some of these issues. Um, let's see here. We're getting, so in the November general election, we had participation rates that again sent, set records. Uh, you can see over the last five year, five election cycles, uh, this also set a record this year. Uh, we had 374,000 voters, uh, who actually cast ballots. And again, 75% cast an absentee ballot either by, by mail or drop off at the uh, clerk's office or bringing it to the poll place. Uh, we had early voting, um, the same as before. We did outdoor voting, curbside voting, and again, drop boxes. I don't know if I said it, but we had uh, 175 towns that, that uh, purchased drop boxes that we reimbursed them for. Uh, again, what worked well, we had low numbers, general safety and general health and safety at the polling places. We had that 30 day early processing, which I think the clerks will tell you was key to their being able to process and report that night. Uh, we had uh, election night reporting. We had 98% of the towns reporting by midnight of election night. 
uh, and they couldn't have done it without that 30-day window to process ballots. Uh, we had strong commu uh, clerk communication. Will and his team did several, uh, generally at least two a week um, directives or guidance to the clerks. Uh, we had law enforcement coordination, again, federal, state, and local. Uh, we, we were in constant communication with our, with our central mail house and the postal service. We had to up our game on cyber defenses. Uh, I've always been, set, set, been caught saying that cybersecurity is like a race without a finish line. It's just, it's never ending. It's not gonna go away. Uh, that is our new world, our, our new uh, system that we have to worry about. Um, we had very low defective rates. As I said, in the pr primary, we had three and a half percent. In the general election, we had one half of 1%. So it was amongst the lowest that we've ever had. Uh, and that I attribute to a lot of the voter education we did through the media, through our media, our, our partners like uh, VPIRG and AARP and League of Women Voters, uh, ACLU uh, and others, uh, through the celebrities and, and, and that we had uh, uh, help us with PSAs. Uh, it all helped us provide confidence to the voters that we, we had this, we were gonna get this done. Um, what didn't work well in November? To be honest with you, not much. Uh, I, but I, I, I will caveat that by saying, if we're gonna make this permanent, we don't expect that without making some serious changes to our systems. Uh, we, we actually have a lot of stuff that we need to look at. We have some checklist issues that, that have to be addressed uh, for mailing errors. We have voter confusion, people thinking that there was no in-person voting. Um, I'm gonna be very blunt here. We had a, we, we've been fighting misinformation and disinformation from the president since probably uh, October. He was, he was out talking about how the election was rigged before the election even happened. Uh, and uh, that was spreading through social media. Here's the concern we had in 2016, we had very little contact with Facebook and Twitter. Um, fast forward to 2020, we had direct lines to both Facebook and Twitter. If we saw something online that was either factually wrong or misinformation of any kind, we could contact them and ask them to take it down. The problem is by the time we see it, millions of people could have already seen it. Um, and so that became a real problem. Um, I will tell you that we didn't have enough hours in the day uh, for the uh, Secretary of State staff. And I'm sure the clerks will uh, say the same thing that they didn't have enough time in the day to, especially in the age of COVID, uh, that, that they were strapped as well. Um, our elections team, we, we've made the decision. We've now had five people in elections for probably, uh, probably 10 to 15 years. We can't do this again without another, at least one more staff person. Um, it just was overwhelming to us. Uh, I know the clerks were overwhelmed. Um, and, and to be put it bluntly, not all the clerks, as good a job as they did, not, they're not all equipped to handle the mail volume that we had. Um, there was a, a tremendous, you know, you have clerks that work five days a week, you have clerks that work two hours a week. Uh, and, and that's not a knock because it's a, it's a function of the size of their town, but uh, um, it, it really is uh, in some cases uh, overwhelming the amount of work and we everything we did this year from the Secretary of State's office was designed to try to take away some of that burden from the clerks, recognizing that there was still going to be some burden there because of all the mail that was coming through. Um, as far as costs, we approximately we approximate the cost to be around three million dollars, and you, there's a breakdown here uh, that we, you know, I don't want to go after each one of these at this time, but but you can see what the cost was. Uh, we were fortunate; we had CARES Act money. Uh, we also had this grant to help us pay for some of this. Um, uh, but the CARES Act money, what we didn't spend, is going back. Uh, we have no way of, of, of spending that. Um, 
And, uh, uh, you know, going forward, we are going to need new uh, tabulators. The ones we have now are in some cases 15 to 20 years old. Um, and uh, it's, it's at the point, these are sold that the hackers don't even like to try to hack them. That's how bad they are. Uh, but, but they still work and they work very, very well. And I wanna be clear about one thing. Our scanners, our tabulators, all they do is count the ovals that are filled in. They don't do anything else. Uh, we don't, they don't create a ballot image that is kept in, or destroyed later. There's nothing like that at all. Uh, so uh, there's, a, and they're not connected to the internet in any way. Um, and, and, and I know that, you know, my, my former town, South Burlington has been using these tabulators for many, many, many years uh, w without incident. Um, you know, we, when LHS uh, is here, they're the vendor that we get the tabulators from when they're with, on election day, they have five people stationed in Vermont in different locations so that they can get to any town within minutes uh, to be able to deal with any problems that may arise. Uh, so we were very fortunate uh, in, in what happened here. Uh, there is a cost if we're gonna go forward uh, this is a cost that the legislature is going to have to determine where the money's coming from, because we don't have federal, we have some federal grant money, but a lot of that money is going to go towards new tabulators. A lot of that money will go towards new election management system upgrades. Uh, and the money is not finite. We don't get a, a uh, yearly or annual uh, 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 grant from, from the federal government. We've had three over the last uh, basically 20 years, we've had three grant drops, uh, one in 2004 or five uh, and the last two in the last three years. Uh, and, and that's been the extent of the money that we have, but I will, I'm, I'm very pleased that my predecessor, Will's predecessor, um, myself, we've been very frugal with that money. And we still are, you know, we have one of our five employees who is fully paid by uh, the grant money. Um, it has, it can only be used, the grant money can only be used for federal elections. So we can't use that money for town meeting. We can't use that money for even House and Senate uh, state, uh, state legislative races. It has to be tied to uh, federal races. Um, overall, Vermont's 2020 elections were a success. No Vermonter had to choose between their health and right to vote. Those were two the two overriding criteria that we used for every decision we made. One, protect the, the right to vote for every Vermonter, and two, to protect the health and safety uh, of not only our voters, but also our town clerks and their poll workers. We obviously shattered participation records in both the statewide primary and with the general election. We kept uh, male participation high, in-person voting low, and polling places safe. Uh, the unofficial report of results for both primary and general election were still reported on election night, unlike some of the other states around the country. Um, we Vermont's handling of the 2020 elections has received accolades from across the country and universal approval from voting rights advocates uh, and all political parties that Vermont did it right. And that really makes me proud as well. You folks should be proud. I know our town clerks are, uh, we, we did a good job with that. Um, we should carefully consider permanent vote by mail, but it's gonna require statutory changes and resources if it's gonna be, if it's gonna succeed. We can't do it the way we did it this year. So with that, I think I'll, I'll just end there and take any questions. So, um... I, what I think I'll do before we um, ask you questions is let Will and Chris weigh in if they have anything additional to say here. And then um, I'd like to hear from the town clerks just a brief um, of what they, if they agree with you, of things they don't agree with, just kind of how they, how they saw it. And from, um, um, we have VPIRG with us, just kind of a very brief statement about what they saw. And so, Will, I don't know if you have anything to add here, but 
we need to thank you? I think I'll let the deputy start if he does. And I'll okay, pick up thank you. After him. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll be very quick. I do just want to reemphasize a couple of things. Education and outreach, I think, was really key through this. And we had so many great partners in that who were willing to step up and do their own like, little videos, messaging to their constituencies, to their members. Um, that was really, really helpful through all this and helped us keep the, the defective numbers down for the general and the voter participation rates high. So we were really lucky to do that. And um, we all got a crash course on how to get things out into the media and how to uh, place digital and radio ads. And we were, we were doing all sorts of things that we weren't used to doing in the Secretary of State's office. So it was uh, like going through battle. Um, we all came out uh, stronger and closer on the other side and are just really gratifying that we pulled it off successfully because this was just the it's hard to explain. You, you just got a, a flavor of it from this PowerPoint, but this is one of the greatest professional challenges any of us has ever faced. Um, and, and we made it through and, uh, and hopefully no, as Jim likes to say, no Vermonter had to choose between their health and their right to vote, which was the goal, goal throughout. And also just quickly want to emphasize how great the, the postal service was because we heard a lot of horror stories in, in a lot of other states, uh, but our experience in Vermont was just really, really great. And then the last piece was this whole thing that was floating over the top of us were these security concerns, because we were hearing threatening things. Um, you know, we received threats in our office ourselves. Uh, all of our state and federal law enforcement partners were great, and we, we really coordinated around election day to include the state's attorneys, to include the attorney general's office, Homeland Security, state police, to be ready to react if something happened on election day. And, and thankfully we didn't need to activate any of that, but I uh, wanna thank them as well. And thank the committee for being, the legislature for being so clear with how we were gonna approach this. You saw the problems in other states where the legislatures and secretaries of state and governor have been fighting and changing the rules right before election day. And that just left an opening for challenging the election and for voter confusion and long lines in the middle of a pandemic, which is exactly what we didn't want. We should be proud that Vermont did it the right way. Thank you. Thank you. Will, do you wanna weigh in? Yeah, sure. And I'll keep, I'll keep it brief too. Um, I thank the secretary for reviewing a very high level of what we went through uh, over the course of the year, but I would just say that, you know, that skimmed the surface and um, there are so many stories to tell and additional details below that, you know, someday I may write a book um, if I ever have time to do anything like that again. Um, I, I was going to say, the deputy took the words out of my mouth that our coordination with the Postal Service was critical to um, a woman named Trina Stokes, who's their political mail coordinator is an unsung hero in this process. There are a few of those scattered scattered across the state that I could tell you about too. Um, one being the maintenance guy that works for the tabulator company, a guy named Mike, um, another unsung hero in this process. But I think Senator White, I think the, the theme of the day was what worked and what didn't. Um, and like we said in the slide, I think uh, in a lot of ways, what we did is what worked. Um, the results spoke for themselves. And I would characterize that, that we embraced the concept of mailing a ballot to every voter. But then sort of with that as the starting point, we really incorporated it well into our unique existing structure of election administration, which essentially is, you know, the fact that we administer our elections at the local level in 246 towns and cities across the state with volunteer boards of civil authority and hardworking town clerks. And that's not an underlying election model that a proactive mailing of ballots to all voters has ever been laid on top of before. In the other states where it exists, those are big states with lots of voters in big cities and elections are typically run at the county level um, in those states. And so counties have different voting systems, for instance, um, and it's just a very different model to lay the mailing of ballots on top of. <clears throat> I think it's interesting to me when I reflect on it that 
clearly because it was such a crisis and we needed to act so fast that that crisis forced us to only do what was necessary. Um, we didn't attach a lot of bells and whistles to the process that were suggested. We didn't have time to overthink things. We really had to boil things down to what we needed to do that was absolutely necessary to get a ballot in the hands of all of our active voters um, to protect them from the virus at the polling places. So I think um, I would like everybody to keep that in mind moving forward when we're thinking about making this process permanent or some aspects of it permanent, that um, we do what's necessary. We don't overthink things. We don't latch on to ideas be just because they've worked in other places, um, but we really consider what works for Vermont and our unique circumstances here. Um, and I think the clerks, the ones who are on this call and the others will be a great resource in doing that um, in telling us what they think makes sense and what doesn't. Our experience, certainly, um, we get, we're gonna bring a lot of knowledge to the table in that regard. Um, but I think I wanna, I wanna keep focused on doing what's right and what makes sense for Vermont um, while embracing this concept, which clearly worked really well to increase turnout, which I, although the goal last year was safety, and it really was, it guided everything we did. Um, a a long-term and underlying goal for the office, for me and for Secretary Condos, is the more people that participate in elections, the better. And mailing a ballot proactively to all the voters for the general election clearly had that result. Um, and so if we stay with that as the goal and we do what we need to do to get there, I think um, we're gonna make some real improvements in the Vermont election system. To be specific, and I hope I don't get out ahead of my bosses here, but um, to me, to break it down a little more specifically for people, what worked was the mailing of ballots to all voters for the general election. What worked was doing that centrally from our office for a number of reasons, consistency um, being the main one of those and uh, relieving the clerks of that, the work on that end of the absentee ballot process um, we need to talk about August and what makes sense in August, because the fact that we have to mail three ballots to voters and have them mail back two um, makes it much more difficult to do a proactive mailing in that context successfully. I think we certainly want to continue and expand the use of drop boxes. Um, Jim mentioned a number over 100 that actually can applied I, for. Um, Will, can I just. Um, sure. What I'd like to do is instead of getting into real specifics now about where we should go, yeah. is to hear from the town clerks kind of about what worked and what didn't work. Because I know you have a long list of things that I, I've seen you present before, a long list of things that um, that we need to address. <laughs> and and yes. what I'd like to do is hear just from the town clerks now. And then I don't know if you came with that list, but then I'd like to uh, take just a, short break to allow people to stand up and um, get their legs working again and then come back and then start getting into some of the details around how where we go does is that make sense totally fine and appreciate it i wasn't going there i wasn't going to that whole list oh i had, oh, about, I had but, about two more and i was trying to give you the what worked simplified okay. from my perspective only related to the mailing of ballots and all it was gonna be was the drop boxes worked really well, the early processing worked really well, allowing the clerks to do that. Um, and that I think where we need improvement is with the tracking of ballots, the notification to voters of whether their ballot's defective or not, and an opportunity to cure those. <laughs> Thank you, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I thought you were gonna start going through your, your list here and that list is very long, I've seen I, it. I can be known to get long-winded. Jim mentioned my bulletins to the clerks. I had I just wanted to quickly tell the story that I had at least two of them refer to them as literature over the course of the year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, well, I see Donna seems to be um, offline right now. So um, let's, let's go to um, John Odom. Do you wanna weigh in here with, um, and just a kind of a brief um, statement about what you thought really worked and not, because what we're going to try and do is get 
real lists of real suggestions for what we need to do from now on. But I wanted to, us to have a kind of a general uh, feeling about what worked and what didn't work before we get into those that list of, of details, because I know I already have a list of about 45 things to change, so. Uh, well, I mean, I'll be brief. Um, things worked really, really well. They worked- Just uh, identify yourself for the record, oh, John. I'm sorry, John Odom, the Montpelier city clerk. Um, yeah, things went, I mean, I was braced for all kinds of challenges and, and we didn't really get them. It went, it went according to, to plan. Now I have a very supportive uh, community very supportive of this whole notion so I, I certainly had that that helping me and I you know that probably is something I should not understate because I'm sure other other clerks didn't you know weren't in the same situation but um, I mean in a real sense even the things that did not go well uh, went well uh, you know we had a lot of issues with our checklist and most of those were you know sort of worked out during the uh, you know, the August process. So, you know, we did have a lot of balances. We did have a lot of work we need to do on the checklist and August showed that, but it also enabled us to do a lot of fixing it. So no, things were correct, were fantastic. Um, in terms of suggestions on going forward, I would, you know, continue the conversation that's been going on and really spend some time thinking about, you know, how this could work for, um, you know, town meeting elections, because, you know, we do create the expectation then, that, which could lead to confusion um, if we turn to all mail-in elections, but somehow not all mail-in elections, at least for those of us who use a ballot on town meeting day. I mean, not having that consistent is a recipe for all kinds of problems. And there are unique problems to doing it on town meeting day that, you know, we've been discussing, you all have been discussing for a while now, particular in particular, that um, narrow gap between um, you know filing deadlines and the actual election. Uh, I mean, we were all in, in uncharted territory uh, in November. Um, now, clerks who are doing this, continuing to want to do this mail-in thing, we're in brand new uncharted territory, and it's it's pretty scary. But there'll have to be some um, consideration to structural changes unique to town meeting day. Uh, rather than you know the other elections, that that would be all I would add. Thank you, Carol. Do you want to? Yeah, um, and I have a list too, which I've already submitted to you guys, so you have it <laughs> of things to do going forward. But yeah. but as far as recapping, um, I I just want to echo what uh, what others have said that that what was vitally important for us, of course, were the partnerships that we had with the Secretary of State's office, with the post office, with the League of Cities and Towns, with the legislature um, for putting together what, uh, what we needed to, to move forward. But I think that the key to the success we had, and I think it'll also be a key for moving forward, is um, options and maintaining flexibility. Um, you know, we looked at the different ways that, that uh, clerks um, conducted August primaries and November elections, walk through, drive through, uh, in person, outdoors. Um, and we're talking about it for town meeting. Do we mail ballots? Do we do Australian ballot? Do we do uh, mailing postcards? And I think that that flexibility is what's really important. Um, as Will said, we're, you know, almost 250 different municipalities or different towns, I should say, we're a lot more municipalities when you count school districts and things. Um, and each one has its own character uh, based on size, based on community. Uh, and we need to be able to de uh, develop what is right for our communities going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Tim, would you like to weigh in? And, Certainly, and thank, we will, you. Uh, thank we will you. Thank you, take, everyone. Just one second, Tim. We will take that list. What I'd like to do, maybe I said it already, I'm not sure is come back after a short break so that we can get our legs working and then then start looking at those lists because I know Carol you've sent one I don't know if the Secretary of State has their list with us with them or not but I bet they can quickly get it up and I'm sure that town clerks have lists and 
VPIRG has a list, I'm sure. So we'll do that. Um, yeah, so Tim, I'm sorry. Not a problem. Uh, thank you, Senator White. I think the thing that can't be overstated is the amount of support the uh, Secretary of State's election team gave us as local town clerks, uh, plus the fact that our fellow clerks supported each other. And we kind of had to invent this on the way. I even uh, found myself doing a YouTube video about how to fill out and return an absentee ballot because there'd been so many in my town who'd never done that before. So this is the kind of out of the box thinking that we've needed to do. Great, thanks. And just so that you know, uh, Tim didn't identify himself, but he is from Vernon. Yes, my apologies. Tim Arsenault, uh, town clerk of, of Vernon, but many of you know me as uh, Hall of Fame broadcaster Tim Johnson from WTSA in Brattleboro. Okay, Donna, are you with us? Yes, I am, thank you. Um, yeah, most things worked out pretty well. Um, the biggest thing that the Secretary of State's office gave us was a mail opener. <laughs> it was the biggest hit in our office. It saved so much time. Um, it was nice to be able to just put them through that the hours were, were saved were, were, were great. Um, and the biggest thing we had um, that allowed us to actually be productive and, and not kind of pull our hair out is the ability to open the ballots um, more than the day prior to the election. Um, we received almost 11,000 ballots back early voting. There's no way we could have handled that on election day or the day before. So um, that's just my biggest thing. That, that was my lifesaver. Thank you, thank you. Stacy. Yeah, same thing here that the ability to open the ballots and process them through the, the tabulator early was, was truly a lifesaver because um, it's not something we could have done either um, the day of the election or the day before. Um, th there was a lot of hours put in. August was a, a little rough for us in our office. Um, we did 1,262 absentee ballots with a staff of uh, two people out of my office. So I was um, I was the person stuffing the envelopes while my assistant was printing the mailing labels off and keeping us uh, lined up. Um, so we were putting out 100 to 150 ballots a day. Um, and we're the clerk and treasurer's office. So uh, everything else got put on the back burner uh, due to that. So um, that was a lesson learned for us there. And, um, but yeah, the Secretary of State's office was, was great. Um, I know, I'm sure they all had their ears burning because at some point every notice that we got or directive, we might've been spitting or sputtering something, but um, it was always, uh, they were always there every time we had an email or a uh, or call or uh, a meltdown of some sort, um, either by a, a clerk or a resident or something, but uh, Going forward, definitely some updates to the, the system and our checklist um, and how um, those get processed. Um, we did have the few bloopers with mailing addresses um, from the system, but um, we now have them all worked out. Good, thank you. Uh, John? Yeah, I just wanna add one quick thought, first of all, to echo all the, the, the compliments to the Secretary of State's office, they were terrific. But also, yeah, I know um, the Secretary of State referred to you know, the, the money that would need to go into this, something to bear in mind from the other side. And you know, again, I hate to always come back to money, but everything comes back to money. I think you're hearing you know, some of the stories about you know, how challenging this, you know, this, this was for small staffs and I know in, in our case, you know, we were flooded with volunteers, which really made it possible. Um, and we're getting a fair amount of volunteers for town meeting day too. But probably think in terms of, of not necessarily thinking about floods of volunteers for every election being something sustainable. Um, so that, you know, you, one of the things to think about is gonna be probably some support for clerks to bring in extra help so you can count on getting this done um, because there is 
again, without that volunteer support, for a lot of us, there's no margin for error and um, it becomes a pretty questionable process. So money on the low end too. I hate to throw that out at you, but there it is. So sort of like election elves. <laughs> yeah. Always are volunteer. So I'm gonna ask um, Paul Burns to weigh in from VPIRG from, so from kind of an advocacy point of view and outsider's point of view, just kind of a high level what worked and what didn't work. And I assume you also have a, a list of things that you're gonna present to us afterwards that you would like to see us going forward. But before we go to you, Paul, I just wanna say, so we're thinking about huge changes here, right? And um, philosophical changes in the way we approach voting and everything. And the most meaningful thing was the letter opener. I just think that what we need to do is we need to not forget that sometimes those things that seem inconsequential are really, really helpful to people and make a huge difference. So thank you, Donna. Uh, well, better late, than, better late than never, right, Donna? <laughs> okay, so Paul? Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Paul Burns. I'm the Executive Director of VPIRG, which is the Vermont Public Interest Research Group. Um, and I am pleased to join you today. I know most of uh, the members of the, I know all the members of the committee and uh, uh, great to see you again virtually. Um, we, as you know, uh, work on a broad range of issues involving uh, government reform and how to get more people to participate in the elections process. So we watched with interest and we were uh, part of this process. I wanna uh, thank the Secretary of State and his staff joining others, just tremendous work there. The clerks and the volunteers across the state, I will just wanna echo others. I mean, it, it should be said and noted, um, just a, an amazing job. Um, and you legislators deserve your credit as well, uh, putting this uh, program in place on short notice and, and even passing it twice. Um, and that was important because we could not have waited. This would not have worked had you waited until after the primary to try to put something like this in place for the general election. I think that that is really clear now. So uh, credit goes to you, Madam Chair, members of the committee and the full legislature for making that happen. Um, from, uh, and I, I should note too, that there are many organizations that participated in the process of trying to make sure that this became the policy that uh, a universally mailed ballot to all active and registered voters was something that happened for the general election. Uh, we had AARP and the League of Women Voters, ACLU, Rights and Democracy, Disability Rights Vermont, Justice for All, Main Street Alliance, Vermont Conservation Voters, VBSR, and there were others, including a number of individual businesses who participated in this and felt that it was really important for them to take a stand and to do this and to encourage their employees to get involved in a safe way. So lots, lots to be grateful for, I think, there, and it's just worth noting. The lessons from my perspective, uh, I agree with so much of what has been said, but people were kept safe through this process, or safer, at least voters, clerks, election workers. The turnout was tremendous. Uh, I will say that we have submitted to Gail uh, just a, um, uh, a bit of material on how, uh, what the impact of vote by mail was um, in the individual Senate districts around the state as well. So you've heard that turnout statewide was 45,000 more voters than had ever voted before. And about 73% of those voted early. Um, and, uh, and so we've, you, when you open that document, you'll see information about your own counties and, and how, uh, you know, how did the rate of participation improve um, this year. I wanna note too that uh, this was not just a presidential election matter. Although voter turnout was higher than ever nationally, uh, we also had some evidence in Vermont that vote uh, that sending all voters a ballot would increase the rate of participation going back to early May when the Essex Westford School District held uh, their vote and found that participation in that local election increased. It was four times higher than the average rate of participation going back five years or so for uh, annual votes there. So a 400% increase over um, uh, more typical participation rates in that local election, which didn't have anything to do with the presidential race. So I just wanted to point out that I think that, that uh, this will is likely to increase participation even in a non-presidential year. 
voters liked it um, for a number of reasons. Not only were they kept safer, but many of them told us, and we included little quotes on, on some of the pieces that you'll read uh, from people who uh, we invited them to weigh in. What did you think about this? We had more than 100 people respond with their reasons for liking this system. And a lot of them said that they could be more informed in filling out their ballots at their own leisure around their kitchen table, taking their time, maybe even taking the time to look up some information. They could go back to an article about the different candidates or what have you. And uh, so that was something that was appreciated by, by voters. Um, it's important that we preserve the local uh, uh, polling places so that people can vote in person. There are people who feel that they need that or want that. Uh, this is important in particular for the disability rights community. There are a number of folks there who have particular issues that, uh, where they can vote more effectively in person. Uh, the new American community, uh, we heard from our partners there that uh, it was important for them to have access to that in-person polling um, as well. So uh, keeping that in place, keeping those options available, we think would be important as well. Um, and having the multiple means of returning those ballots, we've already talked about that, but mail is one way, but you know the drop boxes or returning them to the offices, those are all important pieces. Um, and uh, I do think that I, I, I want to say now that uh, I don't think any of us probably doubt the fact that the election staff in the Secretary of State's office worked more than overtime um, in this process. And if we are going to move forward, as I hope that we will, with making permanent this option for uh, people to fill out their ballots at home by receiving these uh, automatically mailed ballots, uh, having uh, more resources, more staff resources in the Secretary of State's office, certainly something that we think makes an awful lot of sense. Um, so instead of just piling more onto that, those same five heroic individuals, um, maybe spreading that out among a, a little bit more um, uh, human resources there, I think would be great. Um, so, and, and we would keep a lot of what worked for 2020, um, automatically mailed ballots from the central location, the postage paid envelope. I don't know, know that that's been mentioned yet, but we think that that was important. Um, and uh, uh, early processing of ballots uh, and lots of public education as well. Hopefully we won't be swimming upstream against, you know, a lot of misinformation or as much misinformation in the future, but it's still really important to make sure that people understand um, how the system works. And um, so we also wanna, uh, if, if I don't know, the, do you want me to talk about anything else that could be improved now or do you wanna hold off on oh. that, Madam Chair? Okay. No, I, what I wanna do now is take um, a short break because um, I don't know about anybody else, but my legs have just um, stopped working. And um, take a short break, come back in 15 minutes. Just, is that okay with everybody, 15 minutes? That'd be 10 after three. And then start looking at very specific lists of things. And I know that, um, Paul, I know you have specific lists. I know the Secretary of State has specific lists. Carol has some, I'm sure that everybody has an, and what I'd like to do is ultimately get those lists and get them all in one single um, document, all the, all the suggestions, and then we can start grouping them into um, uh, kind of areas of, of um, oh, hey, my brain has stopped working too, in addition to my legs, I guess, but um, we can just start looking then at the individual um, suggestions and how we go forward and start taking testimony on them. I mean, that won't happen today, but we'll start looking at that so that we can have um, some reasonable conversations without looking at everything all at once. Does that make sense, committee? Senator Clarkson, I see you have... It does. I, I'd appreciate it if the committee could ask a few questions uh, about... Sure. because before we jump into the list making. Do you want to do that before you take a break or do you want to take a I break? I want to stand up. Okay, we're going to take a break and then we'll just have some general committee questions here before we go into the, yes, good suggestion, okay? So we are on break. Uh, every, I think we're back. I'm just, yep. I want to make sure everybody's here. Anthony, are you? Oh, there you are. There you are. I'm sorry. <coughs> All right. Well, mm -hmm. I, I I should have. Um, I, I meant to just say 
let's have some committee discussion and questions and just discussion with the people that have just um, given us the information before we um, launch into specific requests. And we may not even get that far today. So what I would suggest is let's just have some general discussion now. Um, Alice, thank you, Senator Clarkson for reminding me. And then um, we'll see how far we get today. And then um, when we're when we've exhausted all our questions and comments, then we'll figure out where to go next. Does that make sense, committee? Okay. All right. So, um, <clears throat> who has some questions, comments, concerns um, from what we have just heard from people? Senator Clarkson, I think you indicated that you had some questions. Well, I, I, I did. I did. I, I am. I'm thrilled about our elections. I think it went as well as, as I only had one constituent who was uh, unhappy or, you know, at least was in communication. Um, I thought they went wonderfully. And uh, I really applaud uh, the clerks, the Secretary of State's office, all of us who were involved in making this happen. Um, I guess I'm just a little frustrated that it's still only 73% of Vermonters turned out after having been handed their ballots on a silver platter. And I look at the other states that do mail, uh, uh, mail in, you know, vote by mail. And, you know, they, they have a, a range from 90%, 85%. Hawaii's is still pretty low, was lower than ours. Um, and I just, you know, why, I guess my question is why? You know, we, I, I was really hoping we'd break 80%. And I guess I just was stunned that we, given all the passion around this election that we we're still at 73%. And I just wanted to know with all the clerks on hand and the secretary of state's crowd, uh, I mean, I think I'd just love to have any insights as to why we're still below 75%. So the way I'd like to do this is just kind of have a general conversation. So if you <clears throat> want to weigh in and respond to this and just have some conversation, just raise your hand so that we can do it in a kind of an orderly manner. So Carol? Yeah, I I think that some of it has to do with the fact that, um, and, and I'm not against this, but I think that the automatic motor voter registration has had an impact because it has grown our checklists. Um, I had, before it went into effect, I had been working very hard to um, get our checklist down to a reasonable number. Um, and uh, I have seen a, a growth of about 20% or more in the number of voters since we went to the automatic voter registration. Um, and unfortunately, there are people who don't care um, and they're now on our checklists. Um, and so, uh, I, and I don't know if there's a fix to that, but I do know that that certainly makes a difference in the numbers. Uh, interesting. <clears throat> Anybody else want to, uh, care, uh, Donna? Um, <clears throat> another issue, I take these off, I can't hear myself. Uh, <laughs> um, another issue that we have is the fact that, and I don't know, Will, maybe you guys know more about this, but I think the ability to take someone off our checklist is 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 tough. So we go through the challenge process. We go through the we go through a lot of steps and two general elections. And and even though it's really easy to add someone back on, it's really tough to get them back off. And especially in South Burlington, when we have a lot of condos and transient people come and go, and they register their DMV and then they leave, but they don't get their license updated. You know. Um, that's a lot of it as well. It, it does take a bit to get people off our checklist, um, but it's really easy to put them back on. Will, I saw you had your hand up. Yeah, just quickly, I, I was going to agree with Carol um, and Donna that it's, but essentially what you're talking about there is just what your denominator is, right, to determine voter turnout. And I'm sure, for instance, um, Paul's probably aware there's a push out there that it makes a lot more sense if we all could start basing our voter turnout on the voting age population of a state rather than the actual registered voters because it would give you a more meaningful sense of how turnout changes over time because um, 
just what Carol said. As long as you keep adding voters to the bottom of your checklist, no matter if more people show up to vote, you're still going to be at the same or a lower voter turnout number. Um, and then, and, and I think that the growth of the checklist surely is a result of automatic voter registration. And then um, Donna is spot on too. I ended with House GovOps this morning, giving them a little lesson. I think everybody on this call knows that law, so I'm not gonna do that. But the National Voter Registration Act is what controls the clerk's ability to remove people from their checklist for the reason of changing residency. And when you're removing someone from your checklist just for the reason that they've moved out, you need to follow the whole process that Donna was referring to, where you send the challenge letter, wait for a reply, wait for them to show up to vote. Right. And if neither of those two, if neither of those two things happen, you remove them after two federal elections. Anybody else? And, and then in general, though, I share Senator Clarkson's wonder at why we can't get people more engaged in the process of voting in this country generally. Senator Colomar. I have a whole different question. Sure. Okay. And I wanna preface it by saying, I don't mean this to be accusatory in any way. Will, I have the utmost respect for everything you do uh, for our elections. I'm not trying to imply there was any malfeasance or issues with our election here. But I think especially if we're going to consider making the mailing of ballots permanent, this is a fair question. Uh, everything went well right now, but there's no guarantee that it always will. Uh, I read somewhere, I don't remember where, I think it was down south in Texas, that there was a woman arrested for voter fraud. And I know that term is still very sensitive given uh, what's happened in the country in the last month or so. But if if I were to have filled out my wife's ballot and or my son's, which arrived without them asking, in other words, they didn't request them uh, through the absentee uh, a ballot process, but they just arrived, what security measures are in place now whereby we could have even known that, let alone, you know, Remy did it uh, and prosecuted me, quite frankly. I think it's a fair question going forward. Again, I'm not suggesting that there was anything improper that was done in our own state. I think we did a really good job, but I think it's a fair question. Yeah, Will? It's 100% a fair question, Senator Colomar. And um, if you were willing to forge the signature of your wife and or your son, so you, you you fill out their ballot for them, put it in that certificate envelope and sign their name for them in some kind of manner that you um, you plan will not be noticed by your town clerk as looking too much like your signature that also comes in with your own ballot. Um, it's likely that that ballot will get processed and um, that your wife and or your son would be checked off the checklist as having voted at that point. Um, the, the most significant check there, I've, I've spoken with you guys about this before, is that then if your wife or son showed up to vote on election day, their name would be checked off the checklist because the clerks are very diligent about keeping track of who they've received a ballot back from. And that's where questions would start to be raised. And the issue would start to be looked into at that point. Um, we had instances of that this year we can get into more of the details of that at any point we want. Um, but it's really that one ballot for one voter that brings that to light at the, at the time of the election. You can't get the vote back, but you can at least potentially go and prosecute the person for, for voting on someone else's behalf. Um, what your question necessarily sort of implies and brings up is a discussion of the concept of signature matching, which we don't do here in Vermont, but which we potentially could do. Um, there are, there's a lot to talk about there that I won't get into too. There are positives and negatives on both sides, I think, of that policy. Um, but for a process we could put in place to try and catch that earlier and right away would be a signature matching and verification process. Am I correct in assuming that in a town like South Burlington where Donna is, 
um, it's a different situation than it might be in Kirby, or I'm just trying to think of a, a town where basically everybody knows everybody and, and would know, maybe have the potential at least to recognize a signature. You know what I'm trying to say? I think that's true. Yeah, I think, I think it's more likely to go through the cracks in the bigger towns and cities. Okay. It's amazing to me how well the clerks know their voters. I know that's not a sufficient voter fraud protection, but um, it's amazing sort of the red flags that get raised if they, they just see something from a household that they don't usually see over the course of other elections. Thank you. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Paul Burns has the little hand up. I don't. Oh, <clears throat> Paul, I don't. OK. Yes, okay, I see that hand now. I never look for little orange hands. I always look for this. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I just, on the first point that Senator Clarkson had raised, I understand that we would love to reach 100% participation, but I, the goal, I think, is to try to remove as many barriers as possible to voting. So that's why the automatic sending of the ballot to all active registered voters in my opinion, makes so much sense, along with automatic voter registration um, and other, we could even go further with automatic voter registration, for instance, as a separate conversation. But I think making it as easy as possible for anybody to participate, even if they make the decision very late in the process and they don't do it in every election, is still a good thing from our perspective. Um, and so they may not participate every time. And, and in those cases, they will bring down the overall percentage of participation. Um, but you do what you can to remove all possible uh, barriers. Why don't they participate? Well, there are lots of reasons for that. They don't see enough of a difference between the candidates, which is hard to imagine in this past election, uh, in, in my opinion, but, but you know, there you have it. Um, with respect to Senator Collimore's question about the voter fraud, it, it's important also to recognize that in those situations, you may see an instance dealing with human beings, there may be these occasional situations where one person tries to uh, steal and fraudulently, fraudulently send in a spouse's ballot or something, but that is illegal. They are doing so under a potential penalty of law here, uh, and they might be caught. There are, uh, as Will Senning pointed out, pros and cons to the signature verification, but in most places that have signature verification, I believe they have to have trained people who, who know how to check one signature against another. It's hard for me to imagine what the expense would be for Vermont to try to have trained uh, people in every single clerk's office to to verify those signatures. So there are challenges if we were to go that way too. Thanks for the opportunity. So, Will, I have wanted to ask you about um, um, following up on Senator Clarkson's um, question about number of people, the percentage of people who vote. You suggested, and maybe I heard you wrong, but you suggested that if we if we took the percentage, if we based it on the population that is um, that could register and vote instead of the checklists that we then we could see a better um, be better trends about it because if the checklist numbers go up but the base population doesn't go up Am, am I wrong about that? Is that and is that something that can be done doing it that way instead? Yeah, like I said, and there's there's a trend towards that. And that's exactly what I was saying is that you over time you get a more accurate idea of how turnout fluctuates. Right. Um, so why can't we do that? We can. Oh, how, how do you how do you do that? Well, you know the population, you know the the demographics of people from eighteen to death. The, the census provides right. A, right. a figure that is your voting age population by right. state. But, but isn't anybody on the checklist entitled to vote? Everybody on the, no, what he's saying is that you would, uh, so you have a population, if you have a population of, if you have a population of 100 that is eligible to vote and <clears throat> Uh, thirty percent of those people vote, whether they're what whatever they're on the checklist or not. Every time you can see, if the next time 
40% of them vote, you know that the, the voting trend has gone up. But if the checklist, if people are put on the checklist without them having any intention of voting, then the, you can't see that increase in the trend. Am I, does that make any sense? I think that's. Uh, I don't, I guess I just don't understand that. I mean, I just assume everybody on the checklist is an eligible age to vote. Yes, but you have people who are not on the checklist who are eligible to vote. Everybody who's eligible oh, right. to vote is not right, on the checklist. Right, not registered. Yeah, because Senator Rahm. Madam Chair, I, I wanted to ask a different question, but I did want to underscore yeah. your point that that would actually be more accurate to redistricting as well, because redistricting is all eligible voters, not just who's on the checklist. And then you'd be able to see in a particular district, not who's on the checklist who voted, but how many of the eligible voters in that district voted, which helps in places like mine with UVM, et cetera. Um, Before but, you yeah. ask your other question, can I ask the town clerks just to um, weigh in on whether that would be a huge issue to if we did it that way? Um, Carol? I don't see it with, that it would have any impact on us as clerks. We're still going to work by the what the names on our checklist. Right. Those are the people who are going to be able to vote. Um, it just changes the denominator in calculating your percentage. Yep. Okay. A different way to look at the data and just real quickly, if you guys are curious, actually on our website where we present turnout over the years for general elections, I forget the specific page, I can get it to you. We have a column that's voting age population too. So you can compare those two. Oh, okay. Okay, great. That's good. Thank you. Donna, did you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, just a, a quick note. Um, I always tell people, don't look at the percentage, look at the number of people who actually voted. That's going to tell you yeah. um, what you really need to know. You're right. Thank you. So uh, Senator Rahm, you had a different... I, I, was, it, I suppose it's a little bit related, but I was more curious about how we might have closed the gap on people who tried to vote but had inaccuracies with their ballot or, you know, just um, what the, I know the percentage I think was a little bigger in the primary of spoiled ballots and then it got smaller in the general and just wondering what kind of tactics people deployed um, and you know, I, there are some bills I think that are going to come to us about trying to engage those tactics statewide. So just curious how that went for people. Uh, anybody care to weigh in? Will, I see you unmuted yourself. Just um, from a number standpoint, yeah, it went down significantly. I think Secretary Condo said it's about 3% or more in the primary and down to one half of 1% for the general election. Um, and most of that is due to the nature of the mailing, the fact that you aren't mailing three ballots out and requiring the two unvoted ballots to come back in a separate envelope. Um, almost all of the defective reasons and the ones that are most common are related to the return of a ballot by mail. So in the general election, the, basically the only two opportunities to have your ballot deemed defective are not signing the envelope or not putting the ballot in the envelope. And actually we've done work in these committees over the last four to six years to um, relax the requirements around defective ballots a little bit. We took the word seal out of the statute, for instance, so that the ballot envelope doesn't necessarily need to be sealed as long as the ballot's inside of it. A lot of the old envelopes, the glue on them was drying out. And so they were coming unsealed on the way to the clerk. Um, mm -hmm. We took out language, I think, that implied that you had to, I, uh, you're testing my memory here, but that you had to include the date and the, the town of residence when you're filling out the certificate. And we made it more clear that the key thing is just the signature. As long as you have a signature on there, it's not going to be deemed effective at this point. But you're correct that that's a, a real point of interest for a lot of people is what we can do about reducing the number of defective ballots and providing an opportunity to correct it. Madam Chair, one follow-up was there were there were a lot of, not a lot, I shouldn't say a lot, a handful of people reached out to me and said they were very worried that um, they may have gotten it in the mail and then realized that their official name, like Elizabeth, is different than how they signed it, like Beth, 
And I just wondered if that was up to the discretion of towns or how that's treated. Signed is signed, whether it matches your official name on the checklist or not. Okay. Carol? I was going to say the same thing. I told voters who asked me about that, your signature is your signature, whether it's your legal name or a scrawl with that nobody can read, <laughs> that's your signature. So that's really where true. it would become an issue, of course, is if we moved into some kind of signature verification. John, I see you joined us. Did you want to comment? I just wanted to make sure you all saw me nodding my head in agreement. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I, um, half of 1% is not a lot of defective ballots. I mean, I, I realized that it means that about 1,700 people didn't have their ballots ca counted. Is that, did I do the math right? I think so. And so 1,700 people did. If all 1,700 were in one house district, that might make a difference, but. Only half of 1%, that's impressive. Yeah, I think that's pretty amazing. And I think um, everybody said that, that a lot of that was due to all the education um, <clears throat> that was conducted ahead of time. So. Anybody have any other issues or questions or concerns at this point um, or just comments to make about the election? Well, yes, Alice, Senator Clark. May I, may I just follow up on what you just said? That only half of 1% were defective. Does that mean, what does that mean? That they couldn't be counted or that they were like Brian's situation where they, where people had put them in by you know in in error and or with malintent or what what does defective mean in this case well do you want to means they aren't counted I means they okay for whatever reason a whole host of reasons uh, there's five okay and it's a so, specific statute yep right for the five reasons they weren't counted <clears throat> Anybody else have any? Um, yeah, just, Senator Polina? Yeah, just quickly, I, I just want to add my appreciation to the others who have spoken about what a good job the Secretary of State's office did and how much faith we had in the fact that you folks were going to be able to carry on and carry through the way you did. It was really impressive and it felt good to know that you guys were doing such a good job. I also find it interesting um, that we're having a very positive conversation about what happened. Um, I don't know, it was, <laughs> I kind of feel like it's a little bit the quiet before the storm kind of thing, you know, I mean, it's interesting to me that, and I, I don't know whether interesting is the right word, but I'm glad that folks who are most deeply involved in carrying this through seem to be committed to trying to make it permanent or at least continue to improve upon the system. And I just, I just point that out. I, I, I thought there would be a lot more controversy than at this point than there seems to be. I know that's partly depends on who's in the room. But I still think um, it's more positive than I thought it would be. And I, I, I like that. I feel good about that. I will um, add on to that, that the um, one of the things that I um, see as a real positive um, point here and uh, a um, validation of the election and how we did it um, was the fact that um, <clears throat> in April and May and June and July, the governor did not, was not necessarily in favor of mailing out ballots. And now the governor <clears throat> is in favor of mailing out ballots and has actually, um, in our conversations about the municipality's annual meetings, suggested that it should be mandatory. So, so it seems to me that the, um, many of the doubters have been convinced that it was a good move, whether we move forward with it or not, that at least it was for that time was a, was positive. Yeah. Uh, Tim. Thank you, Senator. My suggestion would be that 
if we go that route, we should include lots more voter education because as you know, we in Vernon are off the beaten track. So we would uh, need to uh, get ourselves up to speed there. Are you actually in Vermont? <laughs> yes, we are. We, we are indeed south of Route 4. We're hugged too closely by the Massachusetts and New Hampshire borders. But it wasn't you that tried to secede. It was Guilford that tried to secede, right? No, we, we actually love being in Vermont. I wouldn't be anyplace else. I know. <laughs> so any other comments, questions, concerns right now about kind of general what happened and where we might go? And then um, we will, this is going to be a long conversation. I mean, this is because anything we do around elections has to be done this year because we, we simply cannot make changes to the elections during an election year, which will be next year. So any changes that we do will have to be out of our committee. And I don't know, the House might be doing the same thing. So we might have passing bills, but we'll work that out with House government operations. But anything we do has to um, meet the crossover in order to be um, finished by May, hopefully May. Carol? I just wanted to let you know, yes, the House is doing the same thing. They are setting up a very similar looking uh, meeting next Tuesday, so. Oh, good, okay. So <clears throat> do we want to um, jump into suggestions and lists here? Um, committee, I'm going to leave this up to you how you would like to do this. <coughs> it's a quarter to four. I do know that the um, <clears throat> when the Secretary of State gave us uh, the list of things that they were proposing, it took about an hour. Was that am I right, Chris? Was that about? I, that, uh, Madam Chair, that was for all of our divisions, and uh, I think a no, 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 no. Might take well. There was a little bit with OPR, but mostly it was this long list of election. Please, issues. please don't frighten Amarin like that. She hasn't seen. <laughs> In any case, so I I do know that people have these lists that they would like to get to us. And committee, I'm asking you here: Do you want to? start getting into those now, or would you like um, me to collect the lists that people have and put them all in one document and attribute them to the their source so that we can see the ones that came from, there might be a suggestion that came from the Secretary of State and the town clerks and the VLCT and VPIRG. And so that you we can see um, where they came from and who, and and then have um, put them together in a in one long list, or what's your pleasure, committee? I, I and think, the, Senator Polina. Well, I think having you do what you said, or having somebody do what you said, makes more sense. I think, you know, for I don't know, I hate to be a party pooper, but I've been sitting in this chair since about a quarter to nine, um, and I think if we start going through everybody's lists. We'll, we'll be very attentive to whoever goes first and whoever goes second or third is going to get short shifted to tell the honest truth. I think it'd be better to start fresh on another day. I, I'm fine with that. Anybody else on the committee? Senator Collimore? I believe the Senator from Washington District has uh, captured my field. Senator Clarkson? And, and I think it would reduce duplication of uh, of both time and, and ideas. I think it would be great to get it put together so that we can see where the overlaps are. And uh, I think that's a great suggestion and we'll be happy to help you. Good. Senator Rahm? That sounds efficient and I'm a very visual person. So grids or ways to compare and contrast ideas helps me a lot. Okay, so what I would suggest is that at this point, a few, Carol may remember this. I know, I'm sure Donna does. A few years ago, we asked for suggestions on all things elections, any suggestion, whether it came out of this year's election or something that you had a 
brain, a big idea in your sleep last night and you want to put it on the list, everybody get your lists of whatever you would like to see around election changes. Get the, send them to um, Gail and me, okay? And I will get them together by, um, we have next week's schedule um, done, so it won't be next week, but it'll be the week after that. And I'll, I'll send it out to everybody beforehand so that everybody can see. Does that make sense? Yes. Carol? I was just going to say, I, I submitted my um, yep. document earlier today, but it's a PDF. Would it be helpful to have a Word version that can be cut and pasted from? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I think that that would be helpful for Having had a discussion earlier today about PDFs versus Word documents, I think that would be helpful. <laughs> yes, anything that is easier for this non-tech person. Anybody else have any? So I would also, Carol, ask, oh, I'm sorry, Will? Complete your thought if you'd like, Madam Chair. Well, I was just going to say I would ask Carol and the town clerks to notify other town clerks if they have, um, I don't know if you've put it out on your list server, or whatever. And I'll also tell VLCT and um, we have VPIRG with us. And if you would let those other partners know that you worked with, and I know that the League of Women Voters and Campaign for Vermont and, oh, and there's Gwen. Um, so it, she heard her name. So we can kind of get um, the list from everybody and, and there will be, I'm sure, issues that are in complete opposition to each other, but that's okay. That's what we, we need to start dealing with that, okay? I'll put something out on the list, sir, but I'll ask them to send responses to me and I'll compile so that you don't get 8,000 <laughs> emails. Well, that's very nice of you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Will? I just really quickly wanted to go back to your, your comments about what we're getting into here, because it reminded me of something that I wanted to convey and that the secretary wanted to convey also. You're right in both things you said, which is that we're talking about a really big sort of fundamental change to how we do elections and particularly the absentee and early voting part of elections. It's a, it's a big deal and a big project. And you're also correct that we want to do whatever we're going to do for 2020, 2022 this year and not next year. When you put both those things together too, I just think it's important to remember that we have, we have a long game too. And we should, we should all try and think about how far down that road we get this biennium, right? And then we come right back in 2023 and keep working at it and make the next set of progress and change. But that was part of my comments before too about thinking about what we need to do right now that's necessary mm -hmm. to keep this thing going, keep the momentum going, and then continue to build on it two years, four years, six years out from now. <clears throat> well, some of us may be back in two years, four years, six years, and some of us may not. <laughs> Me too. But somebody will be here. So committee, does that all sound okay to you then to, thank you, Senator Collimore. I assume that's a thumbs up, not a, I wanna speak, okay. Um, <clears throat> so let's do that and everybody tell if um, your best friend has a couple ideas, um, tell them to send them in. But, and committee members, let me know where your title 17 is and I will ask Mike to get it because sometimes going looking at title 17 um, jogs your memory and says oh that on page 37 is really stupid let's change it I don't know what's on page 37 but anyway so and <clears throat> Senator Rahm we will um, get you one um, but the rest of us should use our the current ones that we have and um, we're going to get the supplements mailed to us because they haven't reprinted Title 17, so we can use the old one with the supplements. OK. 
Okay. Does that sound good? Anybody else have Sounds anything good. else they want to say today? Thank you. Just a big thank you. Yeah, really. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> we will see you tomorrow. And tomorrow we're going to look, committee, at um, the CARES money that is in the new batch of money and what might be there. So anybody who wants to join us, we look at um, what money might be available for if there's anything for local government, EMS, law enforcement, the um, anything within our jurisdiction. Okay. And Madam Chair, I sent you an email, but um, I was trying to keep a hard stop at three tomorrow, if possible, because I'm supposed to talk to um, former residents of St. Joseph's Orphanage at three, and it, I kind of want to be there on time. If that's, that's okay. well, we start at one. So if we go from one to three, I, I think we will do that. And if we have more that we need um, updating on, we can do it the next week. Will? That reminded me, I, I got an invite for tomorrow afternoon, um, but I feel like the status of the CARES money for elections is pretty resolved. So if, if you don't need me, I, I would plan to not be there. Okay. Yeah, no, we just wanted to get everybody that yeah. kind of is in our, our purview here to um, invite it if they wanted to. Carol? Same here. <laughs> okay. And, and All right. Madam Chair, was there an OPR issue on the agenda for tomorrow? I saw that Lauren Hibbert was invited to that. Oh, as well. Only if there is CARES money that would affect OPR or other um, areas of the Secretary of State. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay.